Biblical perspective and world view. Good afternoon, everybody. What you are about to hear is the fusion of heart, mind, and soul. And I am penetrating the darkness, penetrating the unseen powers by simply speaking the truth of light. The light of truth is what we're all about, sending powers and principalities into frothy fits of frenzy. I'm so glad that you're here with me today, folks, all across the fruited plain and all around the spherical globe. Good afternoon. Hey, I am streaming live from my uh, Facebook page at uh, www.facebook.com slash faithfm91.7. That's facebook.com slash faith91.7. If you've never, ever have liked my page, please like my page and uh, join in the fun here on Open Up the Doors. I'm looking for as much of an interactive experience as I could possibly get so leave some comments let me know where you are uh, watching from on facebook live if you're tuned in over there and please 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 share the broadcast around invite your friends over to open up the doors you can also email me at ajwhite777 at icloud.com that's ajwhite777 at icloud.com and this broadcast is being streamed on the internet over at the faith fm link at hamptonschristian.com if you would like to uh, listen to the simulcast if you're outside of the FM broadcast area. So, folks, I am, as many of you know, I am back from New Orleans and back in the saddle here at Open Up the Doors. And I need, you know, it was a great trip. It's always a great trip. Every year, the outreach is just awesome. We get to meet some some new people every year that take part in the uh, outreach, and it's always a, a great and wonderful time and uh, so many things to share. And, of course, I'm always overwhelmed with what to share and because there, there really just simply is so many things to, to talk about. But, yes, folks, um, you know, <laughs> though we were in the midst, and we certainly were, we were in the midst of the gates of hell. We were in the midst of the cesspool of the devil, yet people were hearing the word of God. You know, people, they always ask when we're down there, they always ask me, why do you go down there? And the answer, my friends, is simple, because Jesus said to go. He said, I I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. So we go. We go. People from all over the country, ministries from all over the country, go for this simple reason, because Jesus loves these people, even in the midst of their sin, even in the midst of their perversion, even in the midst of their revelry, even though they are, are, are enemies of God. You know, the Word of God says that God has commended his love towards us while we were still yet sinners. And something just happened. This microphone like just cut in really, really loud in my head, in my headset. I don't know what that was all about. Anyway, (laughs) hallelujah. But anyway, getting back to what I was saying, God still loves these people. Even the Bible tells us, even while we were still yet enemies in our minds, alienated from the life of God, he is still bidding them to come, brothers and sisters. He is still the savior of the world. And where sin abounds... Where sin abounds, his grace abounds all the more. Therefore, we go 
We go to Mardi Gras. We go to the gates of hell. We go into the darkness. We're piercing the darkness and casting down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Because as I say, light works best in the darkness. And we are light bearers, brothers and sisters, those of us who have been saved, those of us who are born again, those of us who know the gospel of Jesus Christ, those who truly know the Lord Jesus. We are light bearers, sowing the seeds of the pure word of God, which is able to save their souls. And uh, I just want to share some some general observations. I got a lot of things on my plate here today, like I said, and and I, I, I see some of my friends that were with me, some of my teammates that were with me down in uh, New Orleans. Uh, they're on Facebook Live, and I'm going to encourage you guys there who are listening in on, on Facebook Live and comment, you know, just jump in the conversation and, and share some of your thoughts, and I will re- relay it to the listening audience as well if you would like to. But I have some of my, my own personal, obviously, observations and thoughts about this uh, past week's um, outreach. And what really becomes evident in this last day's generation, I would, I would venture to call it even the terminal generation. Oh, the Apostle Peter called it, the Apostle Peter cried out and said, be, be saved from this perverse generation. Whatever uh, terminology you might want to use, I need to tell you, that it is evident that there are so many, <clears throat> and it's sad, it's really, it's truly sad, but there are so many God-haters. People have truly become turned over to reprobate minds, lovers of pleasure, and I need to, to, to just share it, let Looking over this mass of humanity when you're out there on the streets, just looking out over the, the, the multitudes, it draws out so many conflicting emotions in me personally. I mean, one moment you get angry and, and, and cynical, and the next moment you, you feel compassion for their lostness. One moment... I want to call down fire from heaven like the sons of thunder, James and John. And the next moment, I'm hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit saying to me, I have not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And folks, I'll be perfectly honest with you. There is often this inner battle going on inside of me between a righteous indignation regarding the sin and the degradation that is on display right in front of me. And yet the compassion of the Holy Spirit, the compassion of Jesus rises up within me at the same time. The mercy and the grace of God that the, that the gospel of salvation offers. And it's, it's, it's in my own inner being so much there, 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 is a, there is this inner conflict when I'm looking out upon these masses of humanity. People that need the gospel, yet at the same time you want to smack them upside the head and say, why are you acting this way? I mean, really, it's, it's, it's such a... Um, uh, uh, a dichotomy that's going on in, in some ways in my spirit, this, this conflict, this battle, as I shared a moment ago. But, you know, again, the people on the streets, they see us, they, they know we're Christians, they see our signs, and they're constantly walking up to us. If I heard it once, I heard it a dozen times, I heard it a hundred times. What are you doing here? These are sinners. It's really funny, the people that come up to me and point out the fact that they're all sinners as though they're not. <laughs> it's like really funny sometimes. But they'll say, what are you doing here? These are sinners. And I inadvertently always say, that's exactly right. They are lost sinners. And that's why we're here. Because Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus said, I made you fishes of men. And we're, we're in this fishing pond of lost humanity because, because there's a lot of different fish in this, in this big pond. This big pond, there's a lot of fish. And even though there's a, a 99.9% of, of those people are, are, are God-hating and, and lost and don't want to hear what you're saying, the one that comes the one you pray with, the one that you that you sow the seed in that is open, the one out of a hundred, it makes it all worth it. Because Jesus left the 99, you know, folks, for the one. And there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents than over the 99 who don't need it or don't want it or don't have to. 
but it's always about the one because the value of one is important to Jesus Christ. He died for you. He didn't die for a social security number. He didn't die for a a statistic. He died for you. And that's why we come. That's why we come down here to seek the lost. And that's what we need to be doing, church. Those of you who who know the Lord, who are born again, who are listening to this broadcast right now and claim to know Jesus Christ, I want to challenge you today as I share some of my some of my thoughts and some of my the things that we we uh, dealt with down there in in Louisiana. But that's just a microcosm. That's just a microcosm. Of what's going on in the in the world around us in our nation? But we need to be going out and and to reach the lost in this terminal generation. That's what we need to be doing, church. Every other issue that's, that we think is important. You know, one of the things I, I, I was really uh, kind of doing some self-reflection on this past week was how many things I've allowed to sidetrack me, how many things I've allowed to to um, kind of take me out of focus in some ways. Because you know what? No matter how important every other issue is, there's a lot of issues that we contend with. There's a lot of issues that that are important, but they all pale into insignificance in the light of eternity, my friends. They all, all those other issues, as important as they might be in and of themselves, they pale into insignificance in the light of eternity and the souls of men and women for whom Jesus died. And God wants to raise up in these last days, as I shared a few weeks back on my my last broadcast, a last day's army. God wants to raise up a last day's army of soul winners in this season, in this day. And we need, folks, we need to get up out of our seats in the church. We need to get up out of our pews. We need to get up out of our comfort zones. Oh, I've gotten so good at being comfortable. You don't realize how 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 it how it how it just sort of uh, soothes you, but we need brothers and sisters. We need to go to where the sinners are. That's why we go to Mardi Gras. That's why we go into the highways and the byways because Jesus told us to go into the highways and the byways and compel them to come in, and we need to share with the lost. We need to share with them both the kindness and the severity severity depending on how you say it some people say tomatoes some people say tomatoes <laughs> but we need to share with these people both the kindness and the severity of the lord we, we we share the love of jesus we share the love of jesus the grace and the mercy precisely because judgment is coming judgment is coming folks and we need to warn them to flee from the wrath to come We need to remind them that the merciful God, oh, everybody loves a merciful God. Everyone wants to hear about the merciful God. Everyone wants to hear about the goodness and the kindness of God. And I don't diminish that and I don't negate that. That's all true. But the reason we preach about the goodness and the kindness and the mercy of God is that we need to remind them that the merciful God is also a God of judgment. And we need to warn them to flee from the wrath to come. And you know, more and more as we enter into these last days, more and more as we see the end times enfolding in our midst, I want to tell you something. The devil is playing for keeps. This is a generation that is being more and more blinded by the God of this world, blinded by the God of this age. Because the God of this age knows that his time is short, brothers and sisters. And he is fighting with great wrath and rage against the interests of God. And you know what the interests of God are? Those that he died for. The interests of God are the souls of men and women who were lost. That is the interest of God. And as I speak, spoke on the street this week, as my team members spoke on the street this week, one thing became, the scriptures become alive to you in so many different ways. I I need to tell you this. But one thing that really was in my spirit these past few days as we were on the streets was what, what, what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians when he said, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. 
Yes. So many blinded hearts, so many blinded minds because of the God of this age. And you see the God of this age running rampant on the streets of New Orleans during Mardi Gras. Every imaginable sin, every perversion, every corruption is being played out uh, right in front of your face in, 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 in mockery before God, in mockery to all that is holy. Because the God of this age has blinded them who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on him, or shine on them, I should say. It really becomes evident. It becomes incredibly evident when you're in an environment like this, when you're in an environment like Mardi Gras, what Paul wrote in 2 Timothy. I know many of you know it, but man, this this was so, again, just coming alive. The, The scriptures are just screaming in my spirit as I'm on the streets of New Orleans. When Paul wrote, but know this, that in the last days, in the last days, perilous times will come. And it's interesting. When Paul says perilous times will come, in this particular portion of Scripture, he doesn't talk about uh, earthquakes and, 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 and the powers of, of the heavens being shaken. Jesus did talk about those things. But, but Paul's reference point here about perilous times doesn't have to do with the environmental issues, doesn't have to do with, with the geopolitical issues. It has to do with the issues of the heart, the issues of mankind, the issues of humanity. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. And he doesn't say earthquakes and, and famines and, 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 and the shaking of the sea. He says, for men will be lovers of themselves. You see, when men become lovers of themselves, they become haters of God, and we're in perilous times, because in every sin, every murderous, hateful thing becomes uh, uh, exaggerated, amplified, lawlessness abounds. That's what the perilous times that Paul was talking about comes, and it was so manifested on the streets of New Orleans, for men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boasters, proud blasphemers just come down to Mardi Gras. <laughs> All of this becomes amplified and alive, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal despisers of good. Oh, how many people despise the good? How many people with completely without any sense of self-control, all self-control thrown to the wind? I saw, unfortunately, I have to tell you, I saw, I, don't, I try not to look at these things. I try to keep these things away from me. We, 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 we try to avert our eyes from looking at some of the debauchery that's going on. But one of the things that I inadvertently happened to see was when this poor woman this poor, drunken, demon-possessed woman, and maybe demon-possessed because the demons were taking advantage of her, of her drunkenness. But she ripped off her top, and she was, and she was dancing around, bent over, twerking, uh, with, 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 with this, this G-string on. And I hate to be so descriptive, but all the men were, were gawking, and I just happened to catch it by, by sheer accident. And my heart broke as this woman went down to the level of an animal, shaking her breasts around, bent over, twerking, and she was screaming out. And you know what? I probably shouldn't say what she was screaming out, but she was basically telling people to come and you know. I don't have to probably tell you anything. And I just, I turned away as fast as I could. And and you don't even know what to do in that situation other than to say, pray and say, God, open their eyes because the God of this world is running amok in them. And Paul said, this is the perilous times that we're living in. This is, this is, this is the, the, the areas that we're dealing with where, where, where Paul writes that they are haughty and lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, <laughs> having a form of godliness but denying its power I want to talk to you a a little bit about that in the next block because I truly believe, I believe this for for many, many years, of course, but I truly believe, you know, I I say the same thing every year I go down to New Orleans to Mardi Gras. I've been going down for 30 years now. 
as well as other outreaches here in New York and that we do. But every year I say, oh, man, it can't get any worse. I've, I, I think I've seen as bad as it can be. And every year I say, I see something I never saw before. And I say, just when you think it couldn't get any worse, it does. Because, folks, we're living in the terminal generation. And we are living in a perverse generation. But the good news is this, that God has made a way of escape through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'll be back in a minute. I'm going to take a break. But here's the Newsboys with Escape. The Newsboys escape. And thank God he's made a way for us to escape from the wrath to come through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Welcome back, everybody. Andy White here. You are listening to Open Up the Doors here on Faith FM, WEGB 90.7 and 93.3 in Apeague and WEGQ 91.7 in Quag. And I've just been sharing, if you just happen to be uh, tuning in, if you just happen to be joining in, I have been uh, sharing about my uh, re- recent, this past week, missions trip, outreach trip, street ministry trip, evangelism trip, whatever word you want to use, to New Orleans. And I got a lot of a lot of things on my plate. But, hey, if you're joining in, hey, I am over on Facebook Live, by the way, over at uh, uh, facebook.com slash faithfm91.7. You can jump in and and, and Join the conversation there on Facebook Live. A lot of friends are on there. Hey, guys, thanks for joining in. If you got any comments about, I see, I see some of my team members, some of my team members from, from uh, the outreach this past week, Shantae and, and Jimmy and, and Christine are on, on Facebook Live. Thanks for joining, folks. If you got anything you want me to share, just write into the comment box there, and I'll try and uh, see it and share it if you'd like. One of the things, though, I want to get to is is uh, again just my my general observations with some of the things how there's such a cultural Christianity that is deceiving people. People are religious, but they're not saved. You know, I read that long list a moment ago out of out of um, Timothy, where Paul says uh, that you know that, that long list I just read, read: men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, traders, headstrong, uh, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Then Paul says, having a form of godliness. You might think, well, where, where did he get that from? None of this is about is about godliness, but that's exactly the point. They're religious, but they're not saved. There's this cultural Christianity. There's this uh, David Wilkerson years ago called them satisfied sinners. And just the other day, I came across an article that was really, really interesting. Uh, the article was titled, um, To Reach Unsaved Christians First, Help Them Get Lost. To Reach Unsaved Christians. I mean, that, itself, that in itself is an oxymoron. But I knew what, what he was saying. It's an interesting article. I'll probably post it on Open Up the Doors later today. But some of the things that this guy was, was talking about in the article was when he, when he graduated from Bible school, he felt a little bad because he was going to go uh, over to, uh, I, don't, I forgot what state it was, Tennessee or to Kentucky or something like that. Oh, it was Georgia, I think. He was going to Kentucky on the Georgia state line. From, if I remember the article correctly, and he was he felt a little guilty because friends of him friends of his would um go be going off on the missions field, and he felt like they were going you know they were going into 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 really rough areas, dangerous areas. He felt a little guilty, and he said to one friend, uh, you know you know, Godspeed and God be with you, and it's going to be so hard for you. And his friend turned around and said to him, "It's going to be harder where you're going." And he looked at him and said, what do you mean it's going to be harder where I'm going? And the guy said, the Bible Belt is the most difficult place in America to share the gospel. The Bible Belt is the most difficult place in America, he said, to pastor a church. And it's true. In the Bible Belt, many people think they're Christians, but they have no concept of the severity of sin, of the, necess- the, the, the necessity excuse me, of repentance or the message of grace or the overall message of the gospel. They think they're just fine with God and God is fine with them because they aren't atheists or they, or they be going to church because it's a cultural thing. I've been going to church since I was a kid. I can't tell you how many times I heard that on the street. They believe that, that they believe in God. See, they're not atheists, not agnostics. They believe in God, but do not believe that their sin has done anything to separate them from him or that they need Jesus, uh, that they even need the Jesus that they, that they claim to believe in. 
the people who practice this cultural Christianity, they're not atheists. They're not agnostics. This, these cultural Christians, they admire Jesus, but they don't think he's actually needed in a lifestyle of a daily walk. Except, you know, Jesus take the wheel in a moment of crisis. Oh, come on, Jesus. Oh, I cry out to God when I'm in trouble. I cry out to God when I'm in a moment of crisis. That's the God of cultural Christianity. The God of cultural Christianity is the big guy upstairs. And whether or not he is holy and people have sinned against him is irrelevant. And I want to tell you, the streets are filled with cultural Christians. They're filled with satisfied sinners. The homeless, so many of them. I want to tell you, folks, I I know this might be a little controversial. As you know, I don't shy away from controversy too much, not for the sake of controversy, but I want to tell you something. I know there's a lot of ministries to the homeless, and we do need to have ministry to the homeless, so don't misunderstand me. But we, so oftentimes we, 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 we want to blame the government. We want to blame uh, this, that, or the other thing. We want to blame the church. We're always looking to blame some entity for the homeless. But the bottom line is this. I've been working the streets for many, many decades, and 99.9% of the homeless want to be that way. They want to be on the streets. I meet them and I talk with them time and time again. I, 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 I ministered this to, we ministered to several homeless people over this past weekend. But this one guy, Scott, really summed it up the most. I sat down with Scott to share with him. He saw, we were, we were kind of hanging out under the, under the, uh, under the balconies on, on Sunday that just started really pouring, pouring rain Sunday. So we were hanging out under the balconies for a while until it stopped raining. And one of the guys that are homeless was sitting in a the doorway there on a the step. And he looked, at my, he looked at my sign and he started saying, let me tell you about Jesus. So I laughed. I looked at him. I said, okay, tell me about Jesus. My sign says, ask me about Jesus. But I said, all right, tell me about Jesus. Tell me what you think you know about Jesus. So he goes, I'm not going to talk to you unless you come down to my level. Like he was testing me. I said, go down to your level. All right, fine. I sat down with him. I sat down there on the step with him and began to talk to him. And, you know, we started just sharing for a while. The funny thing is, he says to me, you know, when you get to be my age, you, 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 you learn a lot of things and you get a lot of wisdom. And I said to him, well, how old are you? And he goes, oh, don't worry about it. Just just know that when you get to be my age, I said to him, I don't know how old you are, uh, so I don't know what you mean. So he says to me, well, I'm going to be 60 next month. And I laughed. I said, well, I'm 62. And he goes, you're 62? Well, you look like you're 45. And I said, yeah, thanks a lot, but I'll tell you why. Because you're living on the streets. And you're, you're aging twice as fast as you should be. Because this isn't what God has for you. This isn't God's plan for you to be living on the streets. And he says to me, I want to live on the streets. That's where this story was going, my friends. I said, Scott, God's got, God wants, God's got a plan for you. He's got, he's got a destiny for you. And it's not to be living on the streets. It might be to minister to people on the streets, but you, 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 you got a bottle of whiskey next to you. You, you. But his bottom line is this. He flat out told me he likes his life. He likes sleeping on a sidewalk. And I saw him a couple of nights later when it was freezing out. And I, I went by him, and I said, Scott. He was surprised I remembered his name. And I shook his hand. As soon as I took his hand, I started praying for him. And he had a bottle of whiskey. Then he goes, ah, oh, you got to stay warm at night, you know. I said, you don't need to be sleeping on the cold cement at night either. But here's the thing. Satisfied sinners, the, 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 the homeless, so many of them want to be that way. The demon-possessed, some of them want to be oppressed, there's another guy I'll mention, this guy John. I took a picture of him. I got a video of me talking to Scott, by the way, too. But there was this guy John. I shared with him on, on, on I think it was Saturday night. I don't remember what night it was, Saturday or Sunday night. And I was sharing with him. And the guy was just um, basically just all over the place. He was just, he could not keep his thoughts straight. He was telling stories that were just you couldn't believe them at all. He, he told me he had PSTD and he was suffering from PSTD, PTSD. And we were talking and I could see I wasn't going to get very far with him because he just could not hold a rational 
uh, conversation. So I went my way, but I, re- I got his name. That night, later that night, the Lord put him on my heart as I was praying about the people we spoke with that day. And the Lord told me, you're going to see him tomorrow. And when you see him tomorrow, I want you to walk up to him and say, John, the father wants to release you from the oppressor. He wants to release you from that which is binding you up and oppressing you. And I was thinking, okay, God, I'll do that if I see him. God said to me, you're going to see him again in the same spot tomorrow. So I believe it was, again, I don't remember what day it was. It might have been Sunday or Monday, but I did see him the next day. In fact, I think it was Monday, and we were out on the streets, and somebody said to me, hey, that guy you were talking about, uh, the guy that you were talking to yesterday, he's over there again. And I was like, really, he is? That, that was my cue because I knew what the Holy Spirit said to me. So I walked up to him with full confidence. I put my hand on his chest, and I said, John, the Father wants to release you from that which is oppressing you. He wants to heal you of this PTSD. He wants to cure you, and he wants to set you straight in a path of righteousness. I don't even remember what I said. And he just looked at me and said, but I like being this way. God made me this way. And I was stunned. I was stunned. And I, I got a little bit disheartened in my spirit because I was expecting this guy to like jump for joy like in the Bible and be healed and go away dancing and, 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 and glad he was healed. And he just flat out said to me, I like being like this. And I said, Lord, I did what you told me to do. I gave it my best shot. I obeyed you. I don't get it. And then the Holy Spirit said to me, reminded me of something. He said, you know, in the scriptures, sometimes Jesus asked those he was about to heal if they wanted to be healed. He asked the blind man, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to receive my sight. He asked the guy that was sitting out there by, by uh, the pool of Siloam. When people would get in the water, they'd be healed. And Jesus said to, to the guy, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be healed? And something came alive in my spirit yesterday, not yesterday, this past week, with this incident with John. Do you want to be healed? The reason I'm bringing this out is because having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. There's a reason that so many people want to avoid the truth. There's a reason so many people want to avoid the gospel and and, and say they believe in God because it all boils down to having a personal responsibility for their life. And what a great excuse. God made me this way. This is what God wants for me. In their minds, it's the perfect excuse for their sin and lifestyle. God made me this way. is a lie from the pit of hell, brothers and sisters, wrapped in a pseudo-religious mentality. Satisfied sinners, whatever you want to call it, the bottom line is this. As the social costs of Christianity increase, those with only a nominal belief are falling away. The mantra of the day is love, love, love. We hear it all the time on the streets. Love, love, love. That's the mantra. All you need is love. But here's the thing, folks. Human sentimentality is not the same thing as the love of God. I had somebody screaming in my face uh, one night, you know, you're not showing any love. You're not showing any love. As the guy was screaming in my face, this guy uh, uh, said he was a Christian. This guy said he got saved back in 2012. But he was living on, on an emotional level. So that goes back to the article I was, I was trying to, sh- I shared a moment ago. Reaching people who think they are fine, cultural Christians, it's the hardest evangelism of all. I see a lot of, I see a lot of uh, comments flying here on Facebook. If anybody has anything they want me to share, okay. Somebody said we need to put on the armor and stop playing around. That's absolutely true. That's what I'm talking about. Living in the reality of the armor of God, living in the reality of the love of God, because human sentimentality is not the same thing as the love of God. Living in the reality of the love of God will save your soul. Living in the emotionalism of human sentimentality may very well cost someone their soul. I'm not, I want to tell you something, folks. I am not impressed because I see them. I meet them all the time. I see them all the time. I am not impressed when devils and demons quote the word of God to me. And you shouldn't be surprised when the ungodly who are filled with doctrines of demons are able to quote scripture to you. 
The devil quoted scripture to Jesus in the wilderness. The devils believe and they tremble. Satan disguises himself as an angel of light to deceive those without any discernment. I'm going to hit one more story before I take another break. It's, I'm going to shorten it. It was a long story. But there were two brothers. Uh, I believe their name was Dean and Dandy. Uh, Danny. Um, my friend Jimmy was really the one who was ministering to them. But talk about someone giving someone else a false sense of security. You see, the one brother claimed to be a Christian. The other brother was gay. And this guy was yelling at us because he perceived wrongfully that we were condemning his gay brother. That wasn't the truth at all. But he was giving his gay brother a sense of false security. And, you know, like I said a moment ago, getting people who think they're Christians to see that they actually are not is a challenging and sensitive endeavor. This kid, this guy, Dean, was a cultural Christian. And they, they, they claimed to reveal the word of God. But every time I would share the word of God with him, he would throw it under the bus. He'd say, stop, you know, stop telling me that. And I'm like, you tell me you're a Christian. You told me you got saved. And every time, every single time I quote to you the, the word of God, you throw it under the bus. Don't tell me you love Jesus. It got a little heated. And I, I said, I'm going to, listen, don't, don't listen to me. You, you say you believe the word of God. I opened up my Bible to 1 Peter chapter 4 because this guy was, was indulging in the, in the revelry. This guy was drinking. This guy was indulging in the partying, claiming to be a Christian, claiming to have been born again in 2012. And I said to him, here, let, uh, let, let me re- let you read it for yourself. I'll read along with you. And 1 Peter chapter 4, it says, therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin that he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men but for the will of god for we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the gentiles and i said dean this is the will of the gentiles and peter is telling us don't waste our time don't associate with that read it right here and he read it when we walked in lewdness i said dean look around you see any lewdness going on when we walked in lusts, drunkenness, there's a lot of that going on right now, revelries. Hey, Dean, look around. Look around. Is this a reverie? The scripture says drinking parties and abominable idolatries. I said, you're claiming to be a Christian. This is the word of God right here. You read it. Then he says to me, well, what version is this? What version is this? I told him it's the New King James. He goes, well, I like the NIV. I said, well, I have an NIV right here too. Two in my phone. Would you like me to open that up? He goes, no, no, no. You don't have to do that. The scripture says in regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him. I had him read this. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. I said, are you ready to give an account to him right now? His retort back to me was, well, that was written for them, not for us. Convicted, but not converted. Satisfied sinners, cultural Christians thinking they are okay. What could be more perilous to an individual soul than that? We're living in perilous times, my friends. Because if they do not repent, they will hear in that final day, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, and you who practice lawlessness, for I never knew you. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. I've got to take a break. I'm over time. But here's Jason Upton with the Lion of Judah. And I want to tell you, my friends, the Lion of Judah, he's coming back. And he's coming back as a roaring lion to punish all those who disobey the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll be right back. No one knows the day Jesus is coming soon All they hear is the lion Judah of heart, mind, and soul. This is Open Up the Doors with Andy White here on Faith FM. WEGB 90.7 and 93.3 in that peak. WEGQ 91.7 in Quag. And yes, folks, please, if you would like to partner with us, please visit the Faith FM website and 
you know, uh, we're a non-commercial Christian uh, FM station on the east end of Long Island, and we are completely listener-supported. Uh, we cannot sell uh, commercials. We're commercial-free. So we, we're, we're dependent upon your love offerings. We're dependent upon your support. If you would like to underwrite, open up the doors. I am personally looking for some personal supporters uh, for Open Up the Doors. If, if, if you would like to become a monthly supporter of any amount, please, uh, there's a link on the hamptonschristian.com uh, website for, for donations, for giving. Just add a little note to it, a little email with it, saying you would like to support Open Up the Doors, and I would be so appreciative of that. So leaving that behind, I want to get on with some of the things that I'm talking about today because... I've got so much here. But somebody on Facebook Live. Oh, by the way, I am on Facebook Live. If you happen to just be joining us right now, um, I am streaming live on Facebook Live at my Open Up the Doors Facebook page at uh, facebook.com slash faithfm91.7. If you've never liked the page, please like the page. Join in the conversation there and share this. uh, For those of you on Facebook Live, please share this into your streams and invite people to open up the doors. Please leave a... uh, uh, a recommendation on the page, uh, a comment, uh, a rating up on, the, up on the top of the page. You could you could leave uh, your your comments. You could leave a, a recommendation. Uh, I would love that if you could do that. That would be so appreciated. Uh, rate rate the page, rate the broadcast, whatever it is. If you want to give me one star? Give me one star. I'd appreciate five, but I want you to be truthful and honest. I and I read those things. Uh, what what could make the broadcast better? What what would you like me to see cover more? Uh, whatever your thoughts are, I, I would pay attention to them. But somebody here on the page right now, Brother Jonathan, uh, asks a question here. Do you think a demon can speak through a person or a Christian who is walking on unrepentant sin? Jonathan, absolutely. Absolutely. Demons can speak to us. You know what? Satan spoke through Peter, remember, in the Scripture, when Jesus was sharing with the the apostles about how he must suffer and die and be crucified, and Peter turned around and said, far far be this from you, Lord, because uh, it didn't fit with with Peter's uh, theology. It didn't fit with what they thought about uh, their ideas of the Messiah. But what did Jesus answer Peter? Get behind me, Satan, for you do not have the things of God in mind, but the things of men. Demons can absolutely speak through us, not only if we're unrepentant, but if we're just walking in our own human sentimentalities, you know? Peter was walking in his own human sentimentality. I talked about that in the last block. Human sentimentality will will send people to hell faster than anything else because we're going to love them into hell. Love speaks the truth. Love, we, we, we're called to speak the truth in love. That's why people can't, they don't understand. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs that the unrighteous, the ungodly, do not understand justice. They don't understand the judgments of God. But the judgments of God, the justice of God is even those are facets of his love. It's 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 a facet it's a facet of love for his own righteousness. It's a facet of love for his own holiness. It's a facet of love for all those people who walk in righteousness. God has to show himself just. So even his judgments are meant as acts of love because his judgments are meant to be um to be redemptive. All of God's judgments are meant to be redemptive. God doesn't judge anybody because he hates them. But he must judge sin. He hates sin. He hates he hates the ways of sinners, but he loves the sinners as we know. But one of the things I was thinking about with so many millennials being on the streets, of course it's a big it's a big beer bash, it's a big alcohol bash, it's a big college party Mardi Gras. This millennial generation, I really believe that this millennial generation is a terminal generation as well. Because they are a God-hating, God-denying, idolatrous generation, a perverse generation. And sadly, sadly, I believe it's largely because of the contemporary church's failure. You see, today's pulpit will speak of sin in an abstract, generalized sense. But rarely will today's church call out specific sin. The contemporary church in large measure, even worse, is embracing the culture and diminishing the seriousness 
of sin. Folks, today's pulpit won't preach about fornication because there are people in the church who are living together. Today's pulpit won't preach about adultery or homosexuality because our culture says it's hateful to label those behavioral sins. Today's pulpit won't preach about abortion because it's afraid it might sound political or that there there might be some pro-choice Democrats in the pews that they don't want to confront. And the list can go on and on, my friends. In fact, many preachers are avoiding the word sin altogether because it's too negative. Church growth experts tell us that people want a positive message. In the meantime, the church isn't growing, but the apostasy is. The church isn't growing with all these uh, all these uh, church experts and their and their and their theories. But the broad way is getting even broader, and the narrow way is getting even narrower. Jesus, Paul, all the other New Testament writers, they were not afraid to name sins and to specifically call them out. The New Testament writers specifically called out adultery and fornication, sensuality and homosexuality in a culture that was saturated in hedonism. And our culture is reverting back to its once lived paganism. We're all, our culture is becoming just as hedonistic and just as paganistic as the ancient world was. And I want to be clear too. The New Testament doesn't only call out the sins of the flesh, but also the sins of the heart and mind. The thieves, the covetous, the drunkards, the revilers, the bitterness, the wrath, the anger, the unforgiveness, all these things that are sinful. But God is not willing that any should perish, my friends, but that all would come to repentance. But if they don't know that they need to repent of anything, how then shall they be saved? Thanks to a weak need preaching and a de facto appeasement to the culture, the broad way has gotten broader. But Jesus said for us to enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by in by it because narrow is the way. Narrow is the gate. Difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Do we remember these sayings of Jesus? Do we remember the things he said? I don't expect, I really don't expect everyone to stand on a street corner with a sign like I do. That's just one method that I, that I use in evangelizing. In a, in a situation like New Orleans, in a situation like Mardi Gras, it works. It, it's just a fishing pole because people do come up to, to you and say, well, all right, tell me about Jesus. Yeah, you get the mockers. Yeah, you get the abusers. Yeah, you get the persecutors. So what? But again, I don't expect everybody to do that. Some people would feel very uncomfortable doing that. But we all, all of us, are called to go and share the gospel, brothers and sisters, that's my appeal to you in, in the broadcast that I, that I shared two weeks ago. If you missed that broadcast, um, it, you can see it. You can visit. You could just scroll down the Open Up the Doors page. It's there. Or you can go to my YouTube channel. It was called A Last Day's Army. Similar ideas because this is the thing. We, we've got to mobilize this church. We've got to mobilize the church of Jesus Christ in these last days. I'll say what I said earlier. Too many of us. Are, are sitting on the lees. Too many of us are sitting in the pews. It's, it's easy to be comfortable. But there's a lost generation out there. There's a perverse generation out there. There's, there. there's a lost people out there that need to hear the true gospel. We're all called to go and share the gospel. I This morning I posted a picture by way of exhortation on the Open Up the Doors Facebook page. And I took a bunch of scriptures and I and I just compiled them. Because I know how some of us, we get nervous about sharing our faith. We get, we, 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 we feel awkward or we feel uh, uh, shy or whatever the issue might be. But I thought of these scriptures this morning where Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said, for we have been made a spectacle to the world 
So there's a picture of me on Open Up the Doors page holding a sign, being a spectacle to the world. Who is that crazy guy with the sign? I've done it in my hometown in Riverhead. Who is that nut? Who is that fool? But that's what Paul writes. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake. Folks, I'd rather be a fool for Christ's sake than a fool for the devil. I'd rather be mocked for standing up for God than join the mockers burning in hell. We are fools for Christ's sake. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat all people everywhere. Be saved from this perverse generation. My final exhortation to you in the few seconds I have left, brothers and sisters, those of you who have been saved, those of you who know the truth, pray for boldness to share the gospel in this terminal generation. Pray for faith. Get along with God. Get into the word. And go out into the highways and the byways and preach the gospel because that is the Great Commission. That is what God has called each and every one of us to do. We are living in a terminal generation, but God still has made a way of escape for them. Thanks for tuning in, everybody, to another edition of Open Up the Doors. Tune in again next week. I'll be back, but leave it right here on Faith FM. There's more Christian broadcasting coming to you from the east end of Long Island. Have a great week, everybody. I'll be back next week. God bless. Thanks for joining in.